We are on the last chapter of John. <laughs> Who is here for John 1? Does anyone remember John 1? John 1 was over a year ago. Okay, it's been a long time. But we are at the last chapter. And today is not even the last week. Next week, Pastor Sunita is going to close out the entire service. I mean, the whole series. But we are finally at the last chapter. And... In the earlier chapters of John, we, see, we saw the disciples fishing. Now at this last chapter, once again, they are fishing. We are back to fishing. Last week, Jesus appeared before the disciples after his resurrection. And he blessed them and he said, peace be with you. And then he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. He said, my peace I give to you. And if that wasn't enough, he appeared again because Thomas said, I will not believe until I touch the holes in his hands and the wound on his side. So then Jesus said, okay. And then he appeared again. And then he said, Thomas, touch the wounds. And then he did. And he said, my God. And then we, we see here that Peter, having been there, having seen him twice, does not respond the way that we think one might. He doesn't say, okay, I'm dedicating my life to the Lord right now. Peter's response is, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. And I can't help but be so struck by how human that response is. I am going fishing. Peter is going back to what he knows. Peter is going back to his old life. Peter is going back to something that is familiar. The taxes that were imposed by the Roman occupation, they're still happening. Peter still needs to provide somehow for himself, perhaps for his family. There are expectations on him. And so he's in need. And he knows not else what to do but to go back. Can anyone relate? Can anyone relate to something that is holding us back into something? Because that is all we know. That is what we are used to. What are the things that hold us back? And to see, I came to faith kicking and screaming. It's like in my mid-20s, early to mid-20s. And the things that I thought I knew to be good were actually things that were holding me into places that God didn't want for me. These things that I thought were good were holding me into things that God said, you know what, that's not what I have for you. And they might be foolish. They might be selfish, like, I don't know, like dropping out of college and pursuing a career as a professional poker player. Like, I don't know who would do that, right? Right? Or they might be something like trying to win the approval of your father. They might be something like trying to fix something on your own that is beyond yourself. They might be taking up roles that don't belong to you. Many of us come from broken homes. Many of us come from places where Instead of being a son and a daughter, we had to be fathers and mothers for our parents. We had to be peacemakers. We had to be counselors. We had to be the ones that felt like pillars holding our homes together. We had to provide. And sometimes we're being held into places that God doesn't have for us. So, we find here, as we read John 21, that Jesus is calling his disciples out. He's calling them out and then in to something more, something beautiful. And so, today is going to be very simple. We're just going to observe an interaction. We're going to observe an interaction between Peter 
and Jesus? And we're going to answer this question. How are we to respond when Jesus is calling us? How should we respond when Jesus calls us? Okay? Let's pray. Let's commit this time to God. And if I could all ask of you to just pray in your own um, that God's presence would be heavy here. That he would move hearts. That he would awaken the spiritual sleepers. And that we would hear the word of God, the very word of God today. So let's submit this time today because it's holy. And so, Father, we lift this time up to you. Father, fill this place with your spirit, your presence, God. We long for you, to meet you, to hear from you, to wait upon you, God. So, Lord, we know you are faithful. Your word tells us that. We know you answer your people. We know you are good. So we declare that in this place, God. Move your people. Let your word be spoken and heard. And may glory, honor, and power be brought before you and unto you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is John 21. John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. This is the third time. By the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Peter has decided to go back fishing. Peter knows that the tomb is empty. He saw that the tomb was empty. He has seen Jesus twice himself. But he still decides to go back to his old life. Despite all this occurring. And you know, it makes sense to go back to fishing. Because fishing is probably all that he knew. His family was probably a bunch of people who fished. He was probably raised to fish. His uncles probably fished. Everyone probably fished in his life. That is what he knew. That was what he was raised to do. But clearly, clearly we see here that what you were raised to do isn't necessarily what God is calling you to do. What, you're being, what you were raised to do isn't necessarily what God is calling you to do. God is calling him out of that. And I love this interaction between Peter and Jesus. Because Peter goes back to what he knows. Peter is a professional. He is a professional fisher. And he has nothing to show for what he's done. He fishes all night long. And, you know, apparently this is the case because I don't fish. But when you fish at night, the fish come to more shallow water and they feed in the shallow. So it's easier to catch fish. So imagine they fish all night long. Cast the net. It's not like they have a, they're casting a net, pulling the net up. Cast the net, pull the net up all night. And guess what they have to show for it? Nothing. And this is why I think Jesus definitely has a, a, a sense of humor. Because he's almost like talking smack to them, right? Imagine, imagine this for this for you. You spent all night fishing. You caught nothing, 
right? Defeated, sun's coming up. You're like, let's go back. You wasted the whole night. You're tired. You start rowing your little boat back. And this guy on shore is like, hey, did you catch anything? Do you have any fish? No. Does it look like I have fish? Jesus. But he's almost like talking a little smack to them there, right? And as readers, we have the advantage of perspective here. Jesus is calling them out of this. Jesus is calling them out because he's calling Peter back into continuing ministry. He's equipping them with the Holy Spirit. This is the third time Jesus is stepping in to help them. And I am so thankful for this. So thankful because even if there are consequences for our choices, such as fishing all night and catching nothing, God is so patient. God is so patient with us. Instead of rebuking him, instead of saying, Peter, what are you doing? Come on, dummy. What does he say? He says, cast your net. Cast your net. And I think about, you know, the state that they're in. They're like, all right. Like, we have nothing. So, like, what, what could it hurt to cast our net one more time? Right? And Peter, at his all-time low, in his state of poverty, in his state of shame, in his place where he had gone back to what he knew and found nothing there for him, Jesus is so generous. He gives him another miracle. Jesus is so generous, and he gives him another miracle. There is so much abundance to be had when we meet with Jesus, when Jesus calls us, when, when we are in our weakest place. There is so much to be had when Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to meet you here. And he's like, here's a miracle. And they fill the nets. And we can't forget. Let's not forget Peter's last moments with Jesus. Right? This is John 18. These are Peter's last moments with Jesus. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold. And the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them warming himself. All right, this is Peter's first denial. And if we remember Peter's last moments with Jesus, what, what did they look like? Jesus, I will never betray you. I will never deny you, even if death confronts me. And Jesus, you know, turns to them and he says, no, you're, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, no. They go to the garden, and Jesus is getting arrested. And Peter cuts off this guy's ear, and he's very brash, and he's very passionate. And then when Jesus finally gets taken away, what happens? Peter isn't confronted by an army. Peter isn't arrested by guards and officials. Peter isn't confronted with the Jewish authorities, the religious leaders. It's a little girl. A little girl, out of curiosity, says, hey, d didn't you know that guy? And his resolve crumbles there. John writes and shows us how weak Peter's resolve is. And you can bet that Peter knew that. In his heart, he's no, he knows that he's done wrong. He knows that he denied his love. He knows he's wronged Jesus. So what are you like when you've done wrong to a loved one? What are you like when you've done wrong to your spouse, to your parents? See, I'm not like the boldest person. Uh, it's actually really hard for me to be on stage in front of people. So I, like, it, I have to really like 
force it out, right? But when I'm with my wife, I am the boldest, most outrageous version of myself, right? I will dance in front of her. I'll twirl around her. I walk to her. I say what I want to her. I'll hug her whenever I want. I will rip off my shirt and flex all the muscles I don't have in front of her, you know, because it is safe. It is a safe place to be with my wife. And she accepts me because, well, guess what? She stuck with me. That was her decision. But I am bold until I do wrong by her. Until I mess up. And it could be something like I made a commitment to taking out the trash later, and then the morning I hear the garbage truck drive by. <laughs> and then my warm, safe, sunny home gets a little colder gets a little darker. It's almost like there's a draft, right? It's a little cold sweat comes down. And I become more timid. There's something in Korean, it's called nunchiba, right? Nunchiba means like you're like studying someone's face to like get a read. I will get, I'll study her face, but from a distance, right? Because I can't get too close. And I'll call her name. And she'll ignore me. But I become timid. My approach becomes careful. I don't know how to approach. What does Peter do? Verse 7. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. I want us to break this down real quick. Look. The disciple whom Jesus loved has said to Peter, it is the Lord. Peter didn't see Jesus. Peter just heard that John saw Jesus. And Peter's instinct to hearing that Jesus was there was to throw on his clothes and hurl himself into the water and swim. I think it's kind of funny that he puts on his clothes here. It's almost like he doesn't want to show up to Jesus naked, so he'd rather show up to Jesus like soaking wet, right? But he throws on his clothes and he jumps into water. So how are we to respond when Jesus is calling us? Boldly. You run. You run to him. You swim to him. You get to him any way you can. Peter cannot wait. He doesn't want to wait. He doesn't want to wait for the boat to get there. He doesn't let the shame of his failures hold him back from seeing Jesus. He throws himself to him because his Savior was calling him. See, we're all called to something, church. Do you believe that? We are all called to something. If you don't know that, well, guess what? We're all called to something weekly. You were called here to worship and to respond and to give glory to God. That is what you're called to do. We're all called to something. God is calling us to something each and every day. Do not let your failures or the, the lack of progress during the week affect how you approach how God is calling you. See, Peter is foolish. Peter is undignified. Peter is brash. Peter looks crazy. But can you imagine how badly he wanted to see Jesus? Can you imagine how desperate he was to meet him, even though he, know, he knows in his heart he's a failure. He knows in his heart he denied him. He knows in his heart his resolve was so weak. He wants to see him. Everything in him, he throws his body into the water. And my question for us today is, how badly do we want to meet God today? Are we too mature in our faith to have this type of passion? Have we come too far to be like this? How many of us have actually grown in intimacy with God? 
How, much, how many of us have actually grown in passion, have grown in longing to see God? That the more I know God, the more and more I want to be with Him, the more I read His Word, the more I want to hear from Him, the more I pray, the more I just want to stay there with God. How many of us feel that way? Or is faith just something that became routine? Is faith just a box I have to check off? Run. Peter has nothing. He doesn't even have fish. He didn't catch them. God provided that. Peter has nothing. He throws himself at God. What more could there be than to just to meet the Lord, to hear from the creator of the universe, the one who conquered death for his people? What better thing is there than that? What is more important than that? But to meet God. Let's go to verse 8. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus saw, said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the, the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want to focus on what Jesus is doing here, right? Because if we're called to run boldly to him when he calls us, then how then does Jesus respond to his people, right? How does Jesus respond to us when we come? And we can tell by the details that John writes in here, by the very presence of the fire that's there. You see, John is very intentional about the details that he leaves in. I want, look at verse 8. This is really funny. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. So Peter had just hurled himself into the water. The other disciples were following in the boat, towing the net full of fish. They were not far from the shore. So it's like John is almost saying like, yes, Peter went to go swim, and then we had to drag these fish. And it wasn't even that far. So we had to drag these fish. So it's like kind of like this passive aggressiveness there. But John is so intentional with what he writes. He's always like, it's always like he's pointing something. He's signifying something. Another detail that we should look at is... <clears throat> When the disciples were hiding with the doors locked in fear of the Jews, it was nighttime, right? It's fearful. It's nighttime. When Jesus appears to them again here, it's dawn, right? It's almost like we're signifying a new hope, a new day, a new calling that Jesus is giving them. Peter denies Jesus next to a fire. Peter is going to be restored by Jesus next to a fire. N.T. Wright, he writes this, not even the resurrection could wave a magic wand that would make Peter forget his emphatic rejection that night beside the smell and heat of a fire. But Jesus can heal that memory. Think about it. Think of something, like, have you ever had this moment, this might just be me, but, like, you might be, like, showering or doing something random, and then you'll think of something, like, really embarrassing you did, right? It's like, oh, right? And so, maybe it's just me. Okay, fine. But when you have those types of moments, those memories, they're very vivid because they're, they're, like, kind of traumatizing, right? You remember where you were, 
what happened, what you ate, who is there, so that you can avoid them forever, right? And so, like, there are these memories that we have. Maybe they're, they might be traumatic. And we remember smells and places and things. But Jesus, in his fullness, can heal a memory for Peter. If I denied my Savior at nighttime by a fire, you bet every time I smelled fire, I would be reminded of my failure. And we'll see next week. We're saving that for next week. He sets the stage to fully restore him. But how does Jesus respond to us then? He responds to us fully. He responds to us wholly. He responds to us tenderly. He responds to us warmly. He speaks life into death. He speaks victory into failure. Because Jesus comes as the resurrected Christ. And he's calling us to live into the glorious power of that resurrection. Look at the, verse of, at the end of verse 12. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. See, the reason why this is profound is because it is Jesus, but it's not quite Jesus. They kind of recognize him, but this is a fully resurrected Jesus. He is the same, yet he is different. He comes with a different fullness. And so although they can recognize their Lord, they're like, wow, who is this guy? And I find it almost comical that before they haul in this crazy catch of fish, 153 fish, before they haul in this massive catch of fish onto shore, Jesus already has fish cooking. Jesus already has fish on the fire. He's like, come, friends. He already has bread, bacon. He invites them all in to join him. He says, come, have breakfast. Without him, they would have come to, onto shore empty-handed and exhausted from the night. But in meeting Jesus, not only does he approach them, he provides for them. And he gives them rest. Jesus doesn't need for them to have this miracle to have something. Jesus is the provider. Jesus doesn't need us to come with anything in our hands for us to approach him and for him to receive us. Jesus doesn't need that. Jesus is the provider. Jesus has what he needs for us. Amen? And so when he brings us in, when he invites us and he welcomes us in the fullness, he doesn't say, I need you to bring something to make this right for you to be able to sit here and have a time with me. Jesus says, no, I've already prepared this for you. And I've been waiting. Thank God. He is provider. He can provide for himself, and he can provide more than enough for us. And in turn, we know the disciples give their lives in response so that they can spread the gospel, the good news. And if you think about it, if you really think about it, it's the only logical response. If you truly believe, if you actually believe that Christ came and died for us, was resurrected again, if you truly believe and have experienced that God has come for these guys three times, to appear before them, to equip them, to reinstate them, to heal them. How could you not? How could your response be anything else? But Lord, you can take it all. Lord, this is all yours. What does, what, what does anything else, how does anything else compare to what you have for me. So I think about just how good and thorough God is with his people. We cannot dare fathom the grace that God 
has for us. Amen? You know, um, uh, when I first received my call to ministry, it was like really, I think I was like 27. I was like, I was really annoyed. Um, I had a really bad, piss poor relationship with my dad. I found out in my early 20s, my dad cheated on my mom. He had like a 10-year affair. Um, he was an abusive person. He wasn't a nice person. We didn't have a really good relationship. He was like the villain in my life. And when I received Christ in my life, we had this crazy, dramatic reconciliation moment. It was great. It was beautiful. God was really ordained that for me. And I was fortunate enough, even though I had dropped out of college and entered back into college, to get a job in corporate banking in the city. And at the time, my family was like, ah, Doug finally got his head on straight. Thank you, Lord. Right? But my, my father's not a believer, but my mom was like, thank you, Lord. Doug has his head on straight. And, you know, we had this moment, you know, uh, before I moved out, uh, my dad and I, we sat down and we had another dramatic moment. Everything we do is dramatic. But we, we sat down and he's like, pour me a glass. And I poured him a glass and we're sitting there and we're talking. And he looks at me, he says, son, I wish I could be proud of you. And that like, oh, that like tore me up. I had always suspected that this man wasn't proud of me. But he finally like confirmed that he had never been proud of me or to call me his son. And so, you know, I threw myself into different things. I threw myself into work. I tried to figure out like possible ways for grad school because academia was really important for, for, for him. And I thought of just different ways that I could kind of win back my father's favor because, favor because, you know, that's something I really desired. It was something that was in me. You know, as a son, I, I wanted this guy to be proud of his kid. And then I got my call to ministry. And I said, no, no, God. I, I cannot. I will not. And, you know, I, I, I met with Pastor Peter, and I was like, this is crazy, right? Like, I, like this call to ministry. He was like, no, I think it's real. <laughs> met Pastor Kevin back then. I was like, yeah, this is crazy, right? He's like, oh, no, I think that's real. And I cried. I cried. I grieved this thing. I hated this thing. I was up here week after week just crying. And people, I was kind of new to Metro at the time, right? This was like 12 years ago. People were like, who's that guy crying all the time? And I just cried all the time because I was like, I don't want to do it because I know what's going to happen. And when I finally accepted my call to ministry, I met with him. I was going to tell him. He cut me short. And he said, you know what? You're just stupid. You're naive. Do not make this decision. And when I finally received my call and I accepted it, I entered into it, they cut me off for a year. And that year was one of the hardest years of my life. I was 28. I, had, I wasn't making money anymore. I was going to school. I hate school. Yeah, you can laugh. I hated school. I didn't want to be there. I felt so alone. And I said, God, what was that all for? I'm back at square one. What is, what is this all for? And I complained. I complained a lot. And I wish, I wish I could say when God was calling me and calling me and calling me, I wish I could say, like Peter, I ran. Like Peter, I was bold. I hurled myself. No, I went kicking and screaming. And even in that, even in my reluctance, God was so generous. even when he knew my heart, didn't want to obey him. God was so generous. You know, we had just started uh, the midweek service around that time. It was me and Han. We would serve every week because the team that we had kind of put together, they, it, it fell apart. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, this sucks. And so we, we served every week. And, like, maybe two, maybe three people would come out. 
right? And I didn't really care about the numbers. It was just the fact that, like, I, I, I was like, oh, like, just alone again, you know? And so we did that week after week after week. And I was like, what do I have to show? Han's laughing right now. We have, we, and I was just like, man, like, what do we have to show for this? You know, there would be days where it would be like, it, like, it would start at like, I don't know, like 8 o'clock or something. And then it would be like 8.30. We're like, is today the day no one comes? Right? And then someone like, would like stroll in. And I remember I, I, I went home and I just felt, I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I was failing the assignments that were being given to me. And then I got a text. Oh, no, I got an email. Right? My, it wasn't like a phone call. It wasn't anything. It was just an email. My, my parents live in Korea. And the email read something like, Son, I respect the decisions that you've made. And I just want to let you know I support you. And I'm proud of you. I would have never dreamed for him to say those words. Granted, it was email, fine. But this was a miracle. This was my miracle. It had been 30 years at that point. It had been 30 years until I heard my father tell me he was proud of me. And it's because of a decision I didn't want to make. God was so generous to me, even though I went kicking and screaming. I want to let you all know something today. Maybe your faith isn't in the best place. Maybe you're down here. Maybe you're up here. I, don't, I am not judging anybody. I don't care to judge. But I am here to tell you that when we read scripture, when we read this, when we see the way God calls Peter back to him, when we see the way that Jesus receives Peter, when we see all the careful and thoughtful preparation that Jesus makes, the subtle things beyond him actually reinstating him three times, all of the small, beautiful gestures that Jesus makes for Peter to receive him, to heal that memory, to really bring him back into a place where he can minister again. I got to tell you, how could you not fall to your knees and say, glory Glory to God for what you've done and what you're doing in my life. And I'm asking you today, church, how could you not prostrate yourselves to the ground and say, God, I want to love you the way I loved you the first time I met you. Why can't we be so undignified in our worship in that way? What is it? What is it that's holding us back from giving our everything to the Lord? Because he deserves it, no? Who are we to hold that from him? Who are we to hold that from God Almighty? Who are we to say that, not today, Lord, And you know what's crazy about it? If that's you today, that's okay because God says, you know what? We'll try again tomorrow. And he says, you know what? I'll come and call you again and again and again. Because he doesn't give up on his people. My heart for you. My heart for us, for me too. When, when I read the scripture, is that I could throw away myself, throw myself into water, be foolish like Peter, and just give God my undignified everything. I hope that's you today too. Let's pray together.
Let's just take a second um, on our own to respond to Scripture. And I just want to invite you. To tell God you love him. To tell Jesus you love him in your own words. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel ashamed that you haven't done this in a while maybe. But approach Jesus boldly. Jesus doesn't need you to have anything in your hands. He doesn't need you to have anything to offer him. He just wants you. And all he wants is for you to be with him. So imagine you're on a boat. And someone says, it's the Lord. You haven't seen him yet. and you throw yourself into water and you're swimming. You swim to him and whatever might hold you back, I pray in Jesus' name that would stay in the water. Because God does not condemn you. He does not hold guilt over you. He says, I love you. I'm receiving you. I want you to be with me. So Father, we thank you for your immeasurable goodness. God Almighty, Maybe we come timidly. Maybe we come stubbornly. Maybe we come boldly. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for the unfathomable depth of your love, God. There's nothing like you. There is no one like you. So Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit move and that he would awaken hearts, that he would break shackles of pride and shame or whatever that is, and that God, we would worship you freely and fully that we would quite literally run to you. May all the glory, all the honor be yours. In Jesus' name I pray.